Okay, good morning and uh, welcome. We are back to our session on uh, prophetic ministry. So let's begin with a word of prayer. I want to see if any of our online students can please lead in prayer. Let's start and after which we will get into our study. Anybody from the online batch? Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful time that you have given us, Lord Jacqueline God. Is praying. Pastor, shall I continue? Uh, yes, Jacqueline, you can go. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time that you've given us, Lord God, to study from your word, Lord God. Thank you for teaching us, Lord God. Father, we commit this time into your hands. Pastor. Pastor Nancy, and all that she's going to teach us, Father God, help us to hear from you, Lord God. Father, help us to put it into practice, Lord, whatever that you have taught us, Lord. Father, we commit each of us into your hands, whether we are studying online or in, even in the physical class, Lord God. Father, may we be governed by your spirit, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, and thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for leading us. Um, we'll just do a quick recap of what we were talking about in the last class. We said that uh, we could learn from the experience of uh, Balaam, the prophet. And we saw that he explained uh, exactly how he was able to pick up God's communication. We said that he was able to see with his eyes. And then we discussed how seeing with the eyes may mean seeing from the spiritual, through the spiritual eyes. But at the same time, it is possible that the natural eyes can uh, be those tools through which we can look in inside the spirit realm. That's also a possibility. Then we talked about hearing from God. And we said uh, that we hear from God, not necessarily with sound, but minus the sound, God's communication comes into our spirit. So we pick up words. We may pick up sentences, uh, much more than that. Then the knowledge of the Lord is another way in which Balaam said that he received God's communication. So we explained that... Uh, Something like a download coming into our spirit is one way in which God communicates. Uh, we looked at how he fell to the ground and, you know, he uh, was in a trance. Yeah, we discussed about trance. We also discussed about dreams and visions. And we said that uh, uh, these are all visual communication. Uh, we could either have a picture or we could have you know, many pictures like a motion picture and vision, um, visions of the night or some people call it shatai visions are what are known as dreams in the night when we, you know, when we are seeing visions, uh, that's called as a dream. So we've understood all these ways, but today we are going to go further and look at what the Old Testament carries with regard to hearing from God. So what were some of the methods or the usual practices by which people heard from God? The good thing for us to recognize is that God has always chosen to speak. So for us to think that, you know, God is uh, uh, somewhere high up there and he does not want to communicate with us, that would be false because we see that God was speaking, guiding uh, and uh, leading the people even under the old covenant. Okay, So uh, it excites us because under the new covenant and with the Holy Spirit being given to every believer, uh, the way we can hear from God it actually multiplies, the capacity multiplies. So that is the encouragement that we have from God's word. So let's quickly look at how God spoke in the Old Testament. Uh, we'll go to chapter 2 here. So you can all shift to chapter 2 in our notes. The 
one of the primary ways in which God spoke uh, to the children of Israel was through the priests. So in the Old Testament, we have to recognize that not everybody could hear from God or the Holy Spirit did not come upon everybody. It only came upon priests, kings, prophets. So the priests were in that position where they could hear from the Spirit of God. And uh, uh, for them, God had given certain instructions. So one was to wear um, an ephod. Ephod was uh, a piece of their garment which carried stones on it. So they would have uh, um, all the tribes of Israel you know, on that on that ephod, and they would go into God's presence, and uh, you know, God God would um, uh, like it's like the priest is carrying all the tribes of Israel and go meet the Lord, pray for them, and all of that. Now, when it came to receiving God's communication, there were also some other gemstones that were uh, that were a part of. You know what what a high priest carried, and these gemstones were known as urim and thummim. Now I don't know how many of you have uh, paid attention to this when you read the Old Testament, but there were certain gemstones. Why did God give them these gemstones? Because through these gemstones, God would speak to them, and it is called uh, when you uh, interpret what urim and thummim stand for. Uh, it stands for lights and perfections, lights and perfections. So when God wanted to speak to the children of Israel, he would direct them through the Urim and Thummim. So the high priest would have them and God would communicate through those gemstones. Now exactly how God gave them the information they needed, we are not very clear on that. What some people suggest is uh, that uh, maybe God would put some, some light on the Urim and Thummim. Like if it's a yes, then maybe, you know, light will fall on this. Or if it's a no, light will fall on that. If it's, you know, uh, a, a big yes from God, then the light will shine brightly on some of the gemstones. So something like that. Through that way, the priest would know what God is trying to tell them. You know, should we go for war or should we, uh, you know, uh, move out of this place. That's how God would communicate through that Urim and Thummim. Now, some people say that maybe they put it in a pouch and then they kind of, you know, picked uh, a, a gemstone and whichever came based on that, they knew what God was trying to tell them. So there are many speculations on how exactly this was used. But we, for us to understand that this was the mode that the high priest used must be is sufficient. How exactly God spoke, we are not very clear about it. Okay, so gemstones were used. Imagine, you know, today also if we want to hear from the Lord, and uh, we depend on gemstones or something where God says yes, no, uh, it, it would be quite challenging. Thank God, under the new covenant, we don't have to do these things. Now moving on. Uh, after Urim and Thummim, the next uh, way in which people heard in the Old Testament was through a prophet. Remember, I told us if people wanted to know anything, they would search for a seer. Right? In that Samuel's case, we said that. They would search for a seer. The seer will um, ask God. God will speak to the seer and then the communication, you know, uh, the decision would be made. So that was the way. And uh, here we have that passage, 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9. Uh, it's on page 29 if you're following the e-copy. Uh, the scripture says, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. So this is the customary practice which people followed. Uh, and we know people like um, Samuel, they were he was a seer. People like Elijah, Elisha, they were seers. So you, 
people would kind of go to them and then hear from the Lord as to what God was saying. Now, under the new covenant, we know that Holy Spirit lives inside each one of us. So this practice of the Old Testament, even today, many believers, they ask that I want to go to a prophet. And, you know, sometimes you have all these advertisements on TV about some conference that is taking place and all. What people tend to do is they feel that they have to go there. They have to meet that prophet because maybe they are at crossroads in their lives and they need to know, God, do you want me to do ministry? You know, do you want me to take up this job? Um, it's better to go to a prophet because I can hear from God. But you see, this is this happened a lot in the Old Testament. But it need not be like that now, which sometimes people don't understand. That's why running behind prophets, conference to conference, you know, they don't mind paying a big amount of money, going to another nation and attending one conference because there is a prophet. But remember that now with the Holy Spirit inside every believer, that is not necessary. Not necessary. But was it necessary? For the Old Testament believers, yes, because there was no other way. No other way. You got to go to the priest or you got to run behind the prophet. Okay, so it's an Old Testament concept. It's not at all a New Testament concept. So, a good passage of scripture for us uh, regarding this is from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 16. Could somebody please turn to this passage and read it? Romans 8, verse 14 and verse 16. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Okay, just go back to 14, Anand. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Okay, great. So, led by the Spirit of God, Okay, led by the Spirit of God. So it's a privilege that we have today. As children of God, we can be led by the Spirit of God directly. We don't have to depend on any prophet. Second, verse 16 says, The Spirit bears witness with my, our spirit. Always remember that. So the Spirit can bear witness with my spirit, which means... I, whatever God wants to communicate or he's sensing, he can let me know in my spirit. So in my spirit, I can know what God wants me to do. Again, I don't have to run behind any prophet. So always remember, so Old Testament way of doing things was running behind prophets. It's not the New Testament way of doing things because now we are led by the spirit of God. Now, the spirit bears witness with my spirit. Okay. And that is what I need to develop myself in. How to hear what the Holy Spirit is doing. How he is leading me and what witness he is bearing. So moving on to the next section. Uh, we always ask the question, you know, uh, what is a good prophecy? Recently also I was uh, hearing a teaching on the prophetic and then they were saying uh, is it accurate if somebody said something is it accurate and then uh, accuracy seems to be the um, like how do you say based on that you can verify if a prophecy is correct okay so accuracy uh, seems to be at the center of what what one needs to decide regarding the authenticity of a prophecy. But what does the Old Testament say? There's, a, there's an entire passage that talks about good prophecy. What is a good prophecy? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. It's not a very long passage, so maybe I'll quickly read it for us. Here's what it says. 
if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you saying let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the lord your god is testing you to know whether you love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul you shall walk after the lord your god and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice you shall serve him and hold fast to him but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the lord your god who brought you out of the land of egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the lord your god commanded you to walk so you shall put away the evil from amidst you i read it because uh we can see exactly what god is saying what god is saying is if there is a prophecy in this case it comes to pass okay it comes to pass but what that prophecy is doing is it is taking our hearts away from god got it and what does god say if that happens don't listen to that prophet even put that prophet to death but the prophecy came true that means according to us he's a good prophet whatever he said happened but god is saying that's not the key thing that decides accuracy is not the key thing that decides whether a prophecy is from god what is the key thing whether the prophecy is taking you closer to god or is it taking you away from god that is the deciding factor understood not accuracy we can prophesy many things and it can happen but just because it's happening to say that yes that is from god that's that's not what the bible says it's not about fulfillment of what a prophet said got it instead the real test is is it drawing me closer to god or is it taking me away from god if the prophetic word is taking me away from god bible saying discard it don't have anything to do you know in this case the prophet quite severely dealing with the prophet okay so that's a very important point <coughs> for us as believers today otherwise we run behind anything that is spoken and you know it, it seems to be getting fulfilled so look at the integrity of the message whether it is pure is it establishing people in god or taking people away from god that decides what a good prophecy is all about now coming to the expression of prophecy when uh, we think of prophecy it's always about speaking what god is saying right that's the way we express it thus says the lord that's the common uh, usage in the old testament and then they'll say god's message but in the old testament there are other forms of expression of the prophetic word take for example the psalms some of the psalms that um david wrote or even you know the others wrote psalms it seems to be speaking about the messiah so then what does it become it's a prophetic psalm so in the form of song or psalms the prophetic word has been released so it's possible that the prophetic word can come as song it can come as poetry it can come as a parable okay uh, even like uh, in the form of uh, drama okay, and different expressions so when we look at the prophetic word in the old testament people shared it in different ways moses 
wrote a song of blessing in Deuteronomy 33. <laughs> when Nathan brought correction to David, how did he do? He shared a story. Okay, so that's prophetic. He did it in a creative way. Jeremiah's message of the broken pot. Okay, that's also a different way of expressing what is in the heart of God. So when you look at things like this, we see that the expression of the prophetic can be in different ways. So in the Old Testament, similar things have happened. For example, when Agabus, he wants to tell Paul that, Paul, you are going to be caught very soon. Uh, they will seize you, take you away. You know what he does? He takes Paul's belt and he binds himself. And he says, the person to whom this belt belongs will be bound. He could have just said, Paul, you, you will be imprisoned. But that's not how he said it. He did it in a creative way. So creative expressions um, are something that, that we can embrace even today. Yeah. Uh, you, you just mentioned this Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse mm. 1. So here uh, yeah. it was actually talking about the punishment of apostates. It's it talking about punishment of apostates. Okay. So uh, so we we also have to consider all this, like what you have said. Uh -huh. It's not it's not the the accuracy is not important. Correct. But it have to it have to take us closer to God. Yeah. So is this for us also for the New Testament people? Yes, it is. Yeah. Is it taking us closer to God or not? Is the, the biggest test. So then then it was here it was written like we have to like we have to in the sixth verse. Um, so in the fifth verse, but the prophet of or the dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn turn you away from the Lord mm. your God. Mm. So if he says something something wrong that which that which won't happen, yeah. that is clearly that it was telling like he was just trying to take you away from God. Yeah. So we have to put him that's, correct. Correct. That doesn't mean he is an actual prophet and he is speaking from the Holy Spirit, right? He was speaking by his own. If we have to take this as a as a test from God, yeah. Then only if he's a prophet, true prophet. Mm. When he is trying to take us away from God, he is not a prophet, right? Then the commandment also it won't won't be for us, right? Yeah. So you're saying uh, you're talking about the part where it says put to death, is it? Uh, okay. So you're you're the saying context is that only, right? mm, yeah, context is that. So you're asking now, how does it apply? <laughs> See, right now we are under grace. So in the, the important thing is accuracy. Uh -huh. So you, you okay. mentioned this accuracy also. Hmm. That accuracy plays a major role in prophecies and prophetic ministry. That's correct. That doesn't mean like if someone if someone says something and all, if it won't happen, hmm. uh, how we have to take? Is it like what you said that God is testing us? It, it the accuracy is not important. Yeah, yeah. Or or we have to consider what he actually told us is by his own spirit he told. Okay, so then discussing regarding the accuracy part of prophecy. See, we'll come to this later. All prophecy is conditional. All, let me put it this way. All personal prophecy is conditional. Meaning, there are conditions. Even if God doesn't state it. Got it? Uh, let's just look at Saul and David. Their example. I know I'm taking an Old Testament uh, example because it will be very clear uh, what I'm trying to say. See, when God chose Saul, God may have known what Saul is going to do. But what was God's heart for Saul? That, okay, he will do well as king. You know, and definitely God doesn't intend for any of us to fail. That's not God's dream for any of us. But when we look at the life of Saul, we look at his rebellion, we look at his jealousy, there came a point, even scriptures tell us that God was so sad 
you know that that he had appointed Saul and then he had to bring in another man that's when David comes into the picture okay now is it that God chose I mean God knows everything and then why did he choose Saul did God not want a good destiny for him whether or not you know prophetic words over his life Samuel anointed him as king over the people see prophecy is what prophecy is what is in God's heart so what was in God's heart for Saul good that he will rule and reign but all prophecy is conditional even though Samuel the prophet anointed Saul you see that the, the way Saul went about his life he was disobedient he was rebellious so when you don't meet certain conditions he didn't fulfill God's dream for his life Saul is it God's fault no Saul did not do the right things and so he missed it he missed the target he missed the destiny that is what I mean when I say all personal prophecy is conditional when it comes to accuracy of a prophecy of a prophetic word most of the time right uh, personal prophecy we have to cooperate I mean all the time we have to cooperate with God if we don't do that then we may miss out and then we can't blame the prophet saying you said this but it didn't happen in my life there are thousand reasons for why it didn't happen did you get what I'm trying to tell you so it's not just the the prophet's responsibility to see that come to pass the person is as much responsible right as the prophet who spoke those things maybe what the prophet said is accurate but it didn't happen because this person did not fulfill the conditions sorry see okay mm. successful and God have actually a desire for us and then uh, he also know that after after yeah. prof, after uh, he, he want to speak with me through a prophet if if I disobey also he already knew it <laughs> he already knew that I disobey and I'll go away then then what is the use of this prophecy? Yeah, see, God is all knowing. Okay, Anand, right now I'm not able to think of anything specific from the New Testament to tell you, but I think you're you're getting what I'm trying to say because uh, even if you go back to Genesis, God created man, Adam and Eve. Okay, they committed sin. They didn't fulfill God's dream. But thank God, you know, he had alternate plans and then Jesus came, the whole redemption thing, everything happened. So it's God's dream, God's uh, word over our lives. Even man has to cooperate. If the man does not cooperate, it cannot happen. No matter how beautiful that prophetic word is. Okay? Uh, so that is one thing. Second is, when God already knows, why does he, why does he uh, you know, dream? See, that's God's goodness. He still believes that you can uh, do based on your choices. Free will is a big thing, right? And God will not control. Now, knowing Judas, we can ask that question also. Twelve disciples, God would have already known Judas will betray. Then why did God choose Judas? See, God is not insecure that way. He has a dream for everyone, their destinies. He brings in everyone, gives an option. Uh, to do well but because God is all knowing he can get to know what decisions people would be making but even then it doesn't stop him from choosing them he gives them a chance <laughs> right I know it's difficult for us to understand but uh... Okay. So, like, uh, 
when when we are speaking about this prophecy and prophetic ministry uh -huh. when something went wrong something didn't work yeah every when the all the people will blame only the prophet mm. See, because what we'll think is so the the person who is prophesying is prophesying by his own and the, it's there also yeah the yeah. people who do that also but we have to justify our our answer right so is there any references in new testament are there any scripture proof that all the prof personal prophecies are conditional yeah see based on some of these instances that i shared it's already understood that god has given us free will and when we don't make the choices right uh, things don't happen in our lives okay so that in itself kind of proves that man is able to choose and prophecy may or may not be fulfilled now god may have a certain thought for someone but if they don't go along with it then it doesn't get fulfilled okay so anyway i I've, i've stated this much i think if we go further you will get more uh explanation because we are kind of building up from here so is that okay we'll continue and then you should be able to see the answer to your question okay so so far we've seen that uh yes accuracy is something that we look for but at the same time a greater thing to look at is whether the prophecy is taking us closer to god and prophecy can be expressed in various ways uh, uh through art through music and that also gives us uh, the understanding that today when we want to release a word of prophecy you know, sometimes we'll come to all those things like prophetic worship uh or prophetic music uh prophetic art which can actually be from straight from the heart of god and it can touch somebody okay now moving on to music music and the release of prophetic anointing now in the old testament we find that music was very closely related to the prophetic anointing one scripture that we can see is first samuel chapter 10 verses 5 the second part of it so this is where uh there is a company of prophets and on one occasion these this company of prophets uh is carrying a lot of instruments okay and that makes us think so the scripture says with a stringed instrument a tambourine a flute and a harp before them and they will be prophesying so the prophets who were part of samuel's team they were set to be prophesying together with all these instruments so then you wonder prophesying okay why all these instruments so it seems like they were taught to have music and there was something with uh some association of music with prophecy whenever they they played music they were able to prophesy okay uh even when you go to another another story in second kings chapter 3 where um elisha has to prophesy he calls a musician first the musician plays and then elisha starts thus says the lord and he goes ahead and he prophesies so what does this tell us about music music has a property to if you want to say uh, create an atmosphere for the prophetic anointing okay so we can use this for our advantage so today if there is the right music when i say right music again we've got to be hearing from god uh you know as to as to what it is that we should play or sing and when we do that right there can be a manifestation of greater prophetic anointing okay so it's a reality because the prophets of the old testament used this as part of their uh prophesying so we too can do that now 
just because we've seen this it doesn't mean that if there is no music let's take for example you know jesus is walking on the streets uh, street jericho galilee somewhere and all he's just walking and all the people are coming and rushing to him so if you imagine middle eastern sun dust uh, you know he's walking on the rocks this there's nothing serene about that scenery and obviously jesus would not have had some nice music playing in the background when he goes and he starts prophesying or healing people so even minus the music the prophetic anointing can work you understood so just because there's no proper music we can't say that hey i'm not able to prophesy because i don't have good music <laughs> so that is not correct but when there is good music can the prophetic anointing increase that is correct okay um, and that's why sometimes for worship leaders to be very sensitive which song should i sing right now you know what should i play right now it can make a difference in what god is doing in that place if we just without thinking without being sensitive to the holy spirit we just jump in with some song some music it can actually hinder the the flow of the anointing okay but with a little bit of practice we'll come to this we'll go later on to worship okay prophetic worship there there are some practical keys that we can talk about which will help us to flow in this prophetic anointing so in the old testament definitely we see a an association of music with the prophetic anointing okay um, are you all with me can i go forward or how is it okay fine great let's move ahead spiritual demonstrations so the prophetic anointing was also connected to the supernatural miracles when we think about moses moses had a leadership anointing but he's also called as a prophet through moses god did so many miracles and we read about his rod he went with his rod uh, to pharaoh uh, pharaoh's courts and you know he performed certain miracles he went and stood before the red sea the red sea parted when he lifted that rod so you see the power of god manifest through the prophetic anointing that moses carried if you consider other prophets people like elijah elisha full of miracles it's so nice to read you know it's thrilling it's it's better than watching a thriller a movie or anything because god is doing this and god is doing that and it's unbelievable how can all these things happen how can an ax um, float uh, how can a dead man come back to life many wonderful things take place because you see as prophets there was the working of the prophetic anointing through their lives and it manifested in the form of miracles okay so there are many miracles i'm uh, not going to go through it they've listed or everything out here in our notes uh, the widow of uh, zarafath received divine provision from god in 1 kings chapter 17 uh, naaman got healed this is in 2 kings chapter 5 um and so you know in this manner there were miracles that also accompanied the prophetic ministry so i'll quickly talk about one more thing and then stop for today in the old testament there is a concept of the schools of the prophets so maybe you've heard this earlier that when samuel uh, was called by god he did not have good mentors because eli though he was experienced uh he didn't seem to have taken you know done a good job with the temple at that time so yes he shared a few things with samuel but it's literally like samuel had to learn everything by himself and maybe because of uh, that situation he felt that it's important for him to teach other prophets and so we read in first samuel chapter 3 uh, first okay one second one second yeah first samuel chapter 3 uh 
Been upset with Shiloh. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Just a moment, I'm missing that scripture. Okay, uh, I, I think First Samuel chapter 10, where you see this group of prophets coming. How could they even, how could the prophets have even come together like that? Okay, It's because Samuel was running a school where young prophets would come and they would learn from uh, the senior prophet how to actually flow in the prophetic anointing. So maybe that's where he taught all these things, uh, association of music and uh, observing the senior prophet. From that school, it is said that that same culture carried on uh, up until the time of Elijah, Elisha, Elisha Gehazi. Okay. So these concepts carried on and many, many prophets were trained up. So what does this tell us today? You know, there are people who say, uh, don't talk about teaching the prophetic to others because prophecy comes from God, prophetic anointing comes from God. How can you teach people how to prophesy? But if you go back to the Old Testament, Samuel taught people. Anointing, we cannot give anointing to each other, but how to flow in the anointing, that can be taught. So no wonder Samuel was able to equip all those trainees. They were called as the sons of the prophets, or basically they were trainees. That's how Elijah trained Elisha. When you say Gehazi the servant, he was actually student, trainee under Elisha. But unfortunately, Gehazi didn't have the right heart. Okay, who knew? If Gehazi had the right heart, Elisha got double portion. Gehazi may have got, you know, four times. Uh, but you see that it was possible to train up young prophets. So even today, for someone to teach others about how to flow in the prophetic, how to minister the prophetic is very much possible. There's nothing wrong with trying to equip others in the prophetic. Okay, So I know there's a lot for you all to think about. So just think about it. And uh, we will uh, stop right now. We'll come back and we'll you know go deeper. If you want, you can go through the content and come. That will make things much more easier for all of us. OK, so great. So let's uh, stop right here and pray and close. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Uh, and Lord, we believe that even as we are learning from your word, Lord, about the prophetic anointing, that it will be activated in each of our lives. Let there be a, a flow, oh God, Lord, a, a powerful stream uh, flowing through all of our lives, Father. Lord, uh, and God, help us, oh God, to, to minister to weary hearts. And uh, Lord, be a blessing in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you that you're equipping all of us. You're strengthening all of us in the prophetic. Um, and Lord, we give you glory. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so all right, everyone. Take care. Thank you. We'll connect in the next class. Thank you.